Hey, what's going on, guys? My name is Warren Sturry, and we're here today to talk about a very exciting event that's happening right here in Nashville, Tennessee. What we do is we do something called the Tri-Pillar Project. It's a, a cultural initiative that we started about two years ago, which is focusing on res restoring three things to society. And those are the three pillars, wisdom, strength, and beauty. We're here in Nashville, Tennessee, which was once known as the Athens of the South. Nashville was the place to come if you wanted to reach the heights of intellectual enlightenment in the United States at the time. And we believe that Nashville still has that spirit and we're reigniting that spirit with events like this in Nashville. So I'm Warren, I'm the co-founder of the Tripolar Project. And this is Ryan Turbinville. And we are extremely excited to, to feature this event, uh, which we are titled or calling the War for Wisdom. And uh, as part of that, we've got two very special guests, uh, Randall Carlson and Ed Nightingale. Randall will be revealing uh, some uh, plans and updates on a educational project that he has. And Ed is going to be speaking on his book and his research on the Giza template, which uh, covers a lot of lost ancient knowledge of, of ancient Egypt. So we'll be having a, a wide variety of uh, this new paradigm in education and new plans mixed with a uh, really interesting take on some ancient knowledge and some ancient wisdom. And we cannot be more excited to host this for y'all. So uh, with that said, Ed, would you like to give us a brief overview of, of what you'll be talking about? Hey, guys. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to come down to Nashville and present my research to y'all. Definitely looking forward to it. So my research on Giza began seriously about 25 years ago. I took a trip with John Anthony West, and I had an idea of how and why Giza might have been designed. I began with a process of reverse engineering the, the design based on a hypothesis that it was constructed as a repository encoding ancient scientific knowledge. And this was preserved in stone as a legacy for humanity. Um, it, it was designed in a manner that in the event of a major catastrophic disruption, the knowledge wouldn't be lost. The designers and architects encoded the information necessary to rebuild civilization in the aftermath of one of these events. Um, so, and it's designed as a curriculum. Um, once you realize that it's a repository and you, you view it as a complete design with all the structures playing a part, it, it becomes clear. Um, it's designed in a manner that as each step is figured out, it leaves clues to the next step. And it's a, a ge geometric puzzle, like a Rubik's Cube of numbers. Um, the, and the reason for the lack of hieroglyphs was that that would detract from the fact that the language used is geometry, number, mathematics, and which is the universal language. Um, so what I'll be presenting is an overview of the curriculum with several facets or layers. Uh, you know, with each layer is like in the blueprint of a house. Um, each floor has its own plan, uh, differing from each other, but all part of the same house. So there'll be different layers and, and which will pertain to different aspects of this template. Um, so what I'll be presenting is an overview of the curriculum of several of these facets. Um, the uh, book that I published in 2014, the Giza Template, Temple Grail Earth Measure, is the first book in a series. And it deals with the systems of measure, and which is really one of the, the fundamental uh, cornerstones of scientific investigation, of course, measure. Um, and my forthcoming book, Heaven's Measure, Seasons of the Great Year, is a follow-up to that with the celestial aspect of the curriculum, um, which is based on observation. So again, another cornerstone of science is observation and measure which these two books cover. So I'll first demonstrate how the dimensions and placement of all the main structures in Giza were obtained, what information they convey, 
and how all the pieces fit together that really tell a story. Um, aside from the systems of measure, uh, which are the tools necessary to understand the celestial movements that are encoded, I'll demonstrate the reconciliation of four different calendars. An Egyptian calendar that's 36,000 years in length, a, he, the Hebrew calendar, the, the Mayan long count calendar, Mayan, uh, uh, I don't know that it was originated in Mayan, uh, the Mayans, but uh, it is associated with the Mayan long count calendar and as well the Gregorian calendars and how they all fit together and integrate and reconcile and uh, align in the galactic alignment of 2012. Um, so they were mapping the trajectory of our sun, uh, Sirius they were watching, they were watching Orion, uh, of course Regulus and Leo on, on the ecliptic, the zodiac and the processional cycle. Um, so that's the geometry all plays into these calendars. They're all each calendar represents a specific point in the geometry of this motion. Um, and to confirm the temple hypothesis, I'll show how this information has been hidden and suppressed uh, by different groups uh, for millennia. And as well, you know, it was it was passed on in in a way that was necessary, um, uh, and to be hidden. Um, I guess there's there's reason to believe that that's wasn't totally the wrong thing to do. But anyhow, the, the uniqueness of the template with its numbers and angles and and you know just the the different specific. Uh, shapes and whatever it's you know allows easy identification of its use in other structures uh, with other groups of people and and uh, societies or, or whatever um, uh, but it not only shows the use in the structures but the locations uh, based on longitude and latitude of course using numbers uh, using specific numbers that are in the template uh, using them for the longitude and latitude on the ground. And then likewise, in the constellations and their asterisms in the sky, which is mapping the trajectory, which is uh, a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to showing it. Um, but the, uh, the mythology and the stories also go hand in hand with, these, uh, with this map and this trajectory and, and tells a story of, of what happened. And um, it's it's in the great works of art and the symbolism, and it's still used today and it preserves and encodes this knowledge, really assuring that it's not going to be lost. Um, so, what I've been able to do um, throughout the research here is I've been able to track the telltale signs of the template. And I'll present evidence that this knowledge was well known and used uh, in particular here for this presentation, the Knights Templar, or the Knights of the Template. And um, we'll, we'll get into the words as well in this, the linguistics, and I'll demonstrate that a lot of the names for our stars, constellations, etc., actually their names uh, imply their functions. Uh, so that'll be an interesting part, I think, for everybody to, to learn. Um, but we'll see that the Knights Templar in particular, we're going to focus on in this presentation, uh, they preserve this knowledge uh, and the treasures really that they, that they retrieved when they were at the Temple Mount. And which really all those, uh, that information and knowledge and and treasures some really originated in Giza so it all really began there um, but they they hid them uh, eventually after they left the Temple Mount um, they made their way to Oak Island in Nova Scotia and uh, I've done an extensive amount of work on the Oak Island mystery and uh, have been in contact with the Laginis, Laginis on that uh the people who are investigating that in Nova Scotia. 
But uh, the reason why they chose Oak Island really is very simple. It's because the longitude and latitude numbers are directly connected to numbers that are relevant in the positions of stars and and uh, alignments that occur at the year he at the year zero of the Hebrew calendar. Uh, so I'll present that and also show that. Uh, the Oak Island mystery is really connected directly to the founding of the United States of America and how the, the first Masonic Lodge is tied directly to uh, Oak Island, not only in its the year of its founding, but the uh, location of, of its first, uh, uh, the first, uh, Masonic Lodge, which is the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston. I'll also show how Oak Island is tied directly to Washington, D.C., again, with numbers um, that they used uh, that that relate to the, the calendar, the calendars. And um, I'll demonstrate how Washington, D.C. was laid out um, completely using the template the Giza template uh, that was um, based in Giza. Um, so, you know, I hope you'll find all that of interest. And um, the, the I believe, too, that the United States was really founded with the understanding of this template and this uh, cycle of time that really uh, aligns with a great alignment of the 2012 galactic alignment. And um, it was poised to be the, the uh, you know, the, the bright, shining uh, city on the hill, the, the country that really was leading the way for uh, free-thinking men and, uh, you know, just uh, being able to be free thinkers and, and have, um, you know, based on educated people and hardworking ideas which unfortunately now has really uh, been turned against us. And you know, our education system is really uh, deliberately designed to, to dumb us down. And uh, uh, we need to turn that around. And that's what really excites me about Randall's new mission uh, with, uh, you know, turning the education system around and incorporating new ideas with these ancient traditions and wisdom that, that has been preserved uh, by our ancestors and these institutions for millennia. Um, and it was a lot of work to do that. And we need to get back to that and understand what's going on there. And uh, regular people need to understand it. There are people that understand what I'm what I'm presenting here, uh, not all of them have our best interests at heart. So we need to look at it and get get on board with some new education. And, uh, you know, it's just really an honor for me to be a part of this endeavor. And I can't wait to share what I've discovered with all of you and uh, make a contribution to this uh, war for wisdom. You know, so uh, March the 4th, I'm looking forward to it. and. Uh, can't wait. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We're excited to have you, Ed. I mean, uh, Randall, you, you've, you've talked about creating a new paradigm in, in education, but essentially a, a lot of it is is just returning to these ancient modes and traditions of, of teaching. Could you uh, tell us about that? Give us. A well, yes. I mean, <clears throat> that's one of the, the fundamental functions of these these ancient traditional societies was education. Uh, but their thought of education was educating the whole person. And I think those of you, those people who have been paying attention to what's been going on with education in this country over the last particularly half century, but really it was built into the system right from the beginning that it wasn't about developing the whole person. I mean, it was a very factory-based system. Um, the whole structure, of, of the modern education as we start from preschool up to, to, to higher education is, is structured around this, um, a factory mentality in that if you think about the way the day is broken up artificially into, uh, 
segregated classes that have no real relationship to each other. You know, there's a bell that rings and no matter where you happen to be, you could be completely in the zone. You could be on a roll. You could be really, the creative juices might be flowing, but then the bell rings. You got to stop what you're doing. You got to get up and you go to a different class, a different teacher. Um, and, and, and that's just the beginning of, of dismantling this whole process and realizing that it is far from the optimum way of learning. Learning has to be fully engaged. And this is why if you look in traditional societies, the, the, the critical things that, that young people were taught were things that were indispensable to the success and survival of the group, of the, of the tribe, of the society, uh, uh, and so forth. So the idea is, to me, that we need to get back to a, a more organic form of education. And we have to do it really soon because um, we're spiraling downwards really fast. I mean, young people are being turned out without, w utterly uh, without critical thinking skills. People, Young people are not being taught to think for themselves. What, in fact, there is actually happening is they're being indoctrinated into a certain artificially contrived worldview. And it's going to have all kinds of consequences, negative consequences. It's going to lead to um, it's going to lead to depression, to suicides, to failed uh, relationships and marriages because it is not grounded in reality anymore. So what is needed is is a holistic, organic approach to education that does not artificially segregate people according to age, for example, because having a hierarchy of ages is also extremely important in, in, in creating a system of mentorship. You look up to your elders, and those elders look up to their elders, and that's the chain of knowledge transmission. This idea of herding young people into these, into these huge groups where the teacher, the adult is an other, and you now take your primary um, signals as your reality signals, not from those who are smarter than you, wiser than you, more experienced than you, but from your own peers. It's like it, it essentially creates this massive, almost kind of a Lord of the Flies situation. Whereas what's needed, again, is an organic hierarchical system where you have fully matured uh, mentally and philosophically and emotionally healthy adults setting a standard for for younger adults and those younger adults setting a standard of behavior for teenagers and right down the line. And one of the things that I'm doing now with the, the tours that we're doing is I'm trying to bring more children on board, more young people on board. Uh, when we started doing these tours a number of years ago, I had several uh, people call me and say, well, I'd like to come on the tour, but I've got, you know, I've got a nine-year-old. So, so in my immediate response was, well, bring your nine-year-old. And since then now what's happened is each tour we've gotten the, grow the, the number of children and young people are growing. And what I'm finding is exactly what I knew I was going to find was that within a matter of a few days, they become totally integrated <clears throat> into the essentially into an adult society and loving every minute of it. Right now in traditional societies, what happened? You had children get to the age of adolescence and it was believed that adolescence, you started integrating children into adult society. You didn't wait until they graduated from college at 24 years old. But what we have now is a system that essentially wants to infantilize the generations right up well into their adult years so that they're still having to take their imprints from authorities. Uh, and I put that in, 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 in quotes, authorities, because that's what the system is, is designed to do. It's designed to inculcate subservience to authority. And what we need is a system that's completely reoriented about bringing uh, young people into adulthood so that they're fully mature, fully capable of understanding the world around them, fully in, able to integrate themselves into society, to interact with their with their fellow beings um, in, in healthy, constructive, creative ways. And so what we're going to be talking about on this Saturday is what kind of form that approach to education would take. Getting down into the specifics. And it starts with creating a school 
that is essentially outside of the existing paradigm system. Um, that's step number one. You got to get away from completely get away from that because it is beyond salvation. It is beyond redemption at this point. It is a system that has completely gone. It's obsolete. And there's no point, just like with an old, old building that, that, you know, is beyond the point of, of, of salvaging. You, sometimes you just have to tear things down to start new. So what I'm saying is that by tearing down this, this, this system that's come up within the last century, basically what it is, this authoritarian centralized hierarchical system that's come up, it has to be moved out of the way. And then we can get back to the truly organic and traditional. We can migrate those forward into our own time, and then we can adjust them as needed, adapt them to the fact of our 21st century life. But the principles themselves are solid. They're proven over countless generations. And that's what we're going to try to do. We're trying to resurrect that and, and be able to use 21st century technology and tools and science and information to establish a new school slash community slash conference center slash retreat that can multifunction as all of these things, but ultimately to bring people together from all walks of life, from all ages, from all backgrounds, accepting only the, the, the quality of one's character, not the secondary consequences, bring these people together to help establish this freedom network that's growing around the planet that really desperately needs to, to evolve in the, as quickly as possible. And so that's very much going to be what it's about. And it's going to be about how we can use the tools that have come down to us through the centuries, how we can use those tools powerfully to create something new, yet still incorporating something that's, that's hallowed and sacred and ancient that we've uh, inherited because it has been preserved and handed down to us and sometimes at great cost. And so it's going to be the, the, the esoteric, it's going to be the philosophical, but it's also going to be about the practical day-to-day. -day. How do you make it work? And so this yeah. is what we're going to be talking about. And it's only going to really be the kickoff for this, for, for putting these ideas out there. And there's a lot more to it than we're going to be able to, to discuss for a few hours on Saturday, but it's, but it's laying a cornerstone. It's, it's, um, making this the, the first step towards this um this journey back to wisdom is essentially is how I'm seeing it. My background, by the way, is that I have been an educator. I'm a builder, uh is one of my incarnations. My other incarnation is a researcher and educator. I've been uh organizing and teaching classes. I uh, gave my very first lecture in 1980 and have been organizing lectures, classes, presentations ever since then. In the mid 90s I began organizing classes and courses things for for young people, primarily uh uh children and teenagers that had been uh that were being homeschooled that uh whose parents needed um some supplementary education. And so I brought um, several things to the table. I, I taught mathematical courses uh, that began with sacred geometry. So I combined art and mathematics. And by I would teach mathematics by bringing the students through a succession of, of uh, creative exercises, particularly drawing using the classical techniques of compass and straight edge. And I found that that was a very powerful and fun way of teaching mathematics. I also organized many classes and, and field trips going out into nature on various levels to learn about the things that I'm particularly uh, knowledgeable about, which is uh, mostly geology and astronomy and hydrology, glaciology, things like that. So, um, And then I would sometimes bring in um, associates that could also teach about other things that allowed me to learn as well, too. So we might go out in the field and and somebody much more knowledgeable about botany than myself, I would invite them along and they could uh, teach me and other adults right along with the kids. See, and so that's what I tried to do. I tried to integrate so that you had kids, as you know, usually starting at eight or nine or 10, you know, depending on the child, up through adolescence, through teenagers, through young adults, all the way up to senior citizens and covering the gamut. And I found that when you have a group like that, of all ages mingling together, those barriers begin to break down. The, the, when, you know, when I came of age uh, in the 60s and early 70s, there was lots of talk about the generation gap. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that term. Anybody who 
any baby boomer is going to know the term generation gap. That was something that was brand new to my generation. And it was an outgrowth of these gigantic factory uh, high schools and schools that came uh, uh, after World War II. And before that, there was no generation gap because the primary teacher, and this is the way it has always been, and you guys know this well, the primary teacher of, of kids throughout the ages has been their, their, their father and their mother. And boys learned their trade, their craft, their skills from their father. And that was across the spectrum. Now, if it was the elites and the rich, they were given, they were, tutors were hired and so on, but there was no factory system. So that's what we're going to be working on moving away from here. And we're going to be starting at whatever scale we're able to, uh, that the resources will allow. And uh, there's a whole lot to talk about as far as how, and really, really interesting stuff about how some of these ancient and new principles could be applied uh, to this creative work. So that's what we're going to be doing Saturday. Yeah, I'm super stoked. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, Ed, we're really excited to have you. Randall, we're super stoked to have you again for the second time here in Nashville. And for anybody watching what's coming to this event, it's on March 4th, which is a Saturday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Right here in Nashville, Tennessee, you can go to www.trypillarproject.com to RSVP. If we still have tickets by the time you watch this video, hopefully that we do. And uh, I'm sure it'll all be in the description. We'll have a link in there and everything like that. But Randall, really excited to have you back in Nashville, Ed. Excited to show you Can't Nashville. Can't wait, man. Can't wait. And um, event. So I'm, I'm super stoked and I'm really excited about it. Let's do this. Let's uh, yeah. let's wage a war. Let's hang with let's you guys again and seeing wage what a war what emerges wisdom. from these from the this uh, work we're doing together. Yeah, I'm excited. Me too. So thanks thanks for the time, guys, and we'll see you here. Yeah, great guys. Again, I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday, March fourth. All right, see you guys.